Uh, good morning. Uh, this is a joint meeting of House Ways and Means and House Education Committee on uh, September 10th on Thursday. And um, we, uh, Kate and I talked about meeting jointly on um, what, what we've entitled here is planning for next year. Um, uh, uh, really, this is a, um, a response to the concerns that have been expressed, um, particularly from school board members, but I think also school administrators and a number of legislators about uh, sort of the issues involved in uh, setting budgets for fiscal 22, um, understanding that school boards are gonna start engaging in that relatively soon um, and have a number of questions about um, how uh, various um, issues uh, uh, around enrollment, but also around budgets and so on are, are still sort of unsettled. So we, we talked about pulling a meeting together. Um, we, the only witnesses that we have identified are Brad James. We're happy to have you here, Brad. Um, and Mark, um, but we do have um, representatives from school boards, um, the uh, superintendents, um, I believe probably principals, but I'm not sure about that, and AOE here um, in case we have questions as we go along. Um, so, um, Kate, do you have anything you want to start with before we get going? <laughs> I think that's that's uh, pretty clear. We have heard um, that there is a great deal of anxiety that school boards are facing, and they are. We do understand that they are looking for some signal um, that as as they move toward their budgeting, in a time where we really still aren't clear um, what will be happening in terms of enrollment, they're looking for some signal from the legislature. And at this point in time, we're, we're looking at what it is we might be able to do to provide a signal. Okay. Um, Mark, uh, I, I'm looking to Mark and Brad and sort of, um, uh, uh, there've been some, some discussions, Kate and I have had some discussion with staff. I know some other committee members have as well. Um, and so part of what we want to do here is um, have everybody in both committees sort of up to date on um, what we've been uh, thinking about doing um, and then have some input into the process and the content. So um, I, maybe I'll, maybe Mark, I'd ask you to start and sort of lay out the two tracks that we've been talking about so that um, people have a sense of what the, um, what, what a possible uh, path forward uh, might look like. Okay, so um, I, are you referring to a, a letter that might address some of these issues to yeah. AOE so the, and the letter? Yeah, so, the letter? Um, so the, there were two sort of two things. Um, I don't want to get ahead of, of um, uh, particularly of Kate, but um, the um, we've talked about um, uh, changes that we might need to make to the December 1st letter um, and also about um, the possibility of uh, uh, the two committees that would basically be Kate and me uh, writing a letter to the agency uh, requesting um, information data that we um, uh, will be able to use uh, next year and so that we can respond quickly. So I, I would start, I think let's start with the December 1st letter because sure. that's already current law and it may require a change. Right, so um, uh, you, when the legislature adjourns at the end of this month, there's gonna be a, um, a projected deficit in the education fund for FY21. Um, under current law, and you, and you won't be back until January to address that issue. Um, in Act 122, the legislature indicated its intent to address that deficit, that projected deficit in FY21 by using federal money or a number of other options that you laid out in Act 122. The problem is, is that under current law, um, the commissioner is gonna be um, issuing a letter that recommends education tax rates for FY22 on December 1st. So you won't be here at the time that letter comes out. And if we follow current law, um, when the commissioner makes that recommendation, he would have to set tax rate, education property tax rates high enough to 
um, cover that projected deficit. So the tax rates are going to be, from the legislature's perspective, that recommendation would produce an artificially high education property tax rate because it would assume that taxpayers are going to remedy that situation by having higher property taxes. Um, so one, one possibility would be to um, make a uh, session law change to the way that the commissioner um, calculates that tax rate such that he did not include any projected FY21 deficit in that number. Um, so is, is everybody with me so far? So um, that, that would require you to pass um, some session law. Um, Abby Shepard has um, been working on a draft on that. Um, and it would do two things. One, it would, it would preclude the commissioner from issuing a tax rate letter that has an artificially high property tax rate in it. And it would also provide some assurance to school districts that um, they can proceed without having to um, worry about the impact of this deficit on property taxes. So um, I guess I'll stop there if that, if that makes sense. No. Um, it always takes a minute for people to yep. ask questions. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's tricky. <laughs> yeah. um, and I, 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 Scott Beck has one. Okay. Hey, Mark, maybe I'm getting ahead of myself, but if the deficit isn't the responsibility of property taxpayers, whose responsibility is it? Okay, in, in Act 122, and uh, I can pop up that language, I think, for you, um, okay. the legislature indicated that if a deficit remained in the education fund, a projected deficit for F-121 remained, you would address it through one of, I think, six or seven different options. I don't have them right in front of me right now, but the first one was to use federal money to the extent possible, use reversions, and then there was a whole list of okay. other ways of addressing this. So okay. what, what, what we're really doing here is, um, if, if the tax rate letter was done per normal under current law, it would be ignoring the legislature's explicit intent to not use the property tax money to cover that deficit. Now, if, if everybody's clear on that so far, there's one other wrinkle in here I just wanted to point out. Um, I, the Education Fund Outlook is not, a, is not a fund statement, although it looks a lot like one. And so what we've shown on there um, at the request of the legislature is a full stabilization reserve or close to a full stabilization reserve in FY21 and then a $66 million deficit. Under accounting rules, that's not the way it would be shown. Under accounting rules, it would show that you have a $66 million shortfall, but you have $38 million to address that. So the deficit would only be 28 or whatever that comes out to $28 million. So um, in the draft, I was concerned that um, if the administration chose to interpret the, the, the law that way and claim that the deficit wasn't 66 million, but only a smaller amount, 28 or something, then they would be able to, you, 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 wouldn't, you would still see a bump in the tax rate because going from FY21 into FY22, the stabilization reserve would be empty. And under the current law, the stabilization reserve would have to be filled up. I can, I can see confusion. I'm sorry on this, but. Um, Maybe you got a little bit ahead of us. Okay. Um, <laughs> Let, let me, I can back up again. So um, maybe, Sorsha, is it possible to pop up the education fund outlook? Okay, well, let me just follow yeah. up on my question, Mark. I mean, I, sure. I had assumed when you said if there's a deficit that we had used or attempted to use the smorgasbord of um, options that we laid out in Act 122. Right. Um, I had assumed that those, all of those options had been exhausted and that there was still a deficit left over um, right that's what i'm i mean that was my assumption okay um i i interpreted it to mean that when you come back in january if there were if there's deficits remaining you'll have the opportunity when you come back in january to um address any remaining problems through one of those options that are available but also at this point we don't know how much how what the deficit will look like by then because like you know brad's going to talk um, this morning i think as well about the the amount of um reimbursement requests that have come in from districts and some amount of that money is going to be available to offset that that deficit, I think. No, I, so, I get it. It'll be a moving target. We've got a, we've got a moving target, but 
Um, if you look, I don't have the language right in front of me, but we can pop up the language in Act 120 and uh, Act 122, and it, it pr pretty clearly states that the legislature's intent is to not use the property tax to address this problem um, in FY20, right. and it'll carry forward. Um, I, I okay. see um, um, Peter Anthony. Um, or, yeah, Peter's got a question. Go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you. I, it seems to me just to focus on the issue that uh, Mark has laid in our lap about the mandate as it currently stands without a change of via session law, that um, it seems to me is fairly straightforwardly addressed in the sense that we've pretty co uh, consistently said what we want to do in respect to superintendencies, districts, principals is give them some sense of stability, et cetera, steady as you go. So it seems to me, I'm eager to hear from Brad, but, and the ADM is a separate issue from my point of view, to get them to be able to plan and budget, we simply need to set a signal whether or not we are or aren't going to allow uh, the, um, the deficit essentially to influence. And my answer is no, we shouldn't. The question is, do you want to build in any kind of uh, inflation factor when you tell everybody Here's the, here's the uh, property tax uh, that you can expect for the next fiscal year. Whether it does have an inflator or it doesn't is something we ought to debate and just turn it into session law. And then we move on and, and worry about student count and all the flux in, in enrollment, which is, for me, a tougher nut to crack. Thank you. So I would, I would just say to that that um, what, I'm, what I'm describing would just preclude the calculation or the, or the recommendation of the tax rates for FY22 to include the deficit. If, if any, any increase in school spending would have to be reflected in the, in the tax rate recommendations for the next year. So very similar to what you did this year. You said that we're, we're gonna fund schools and we're not gonna increase the property tax um, dramatically to cover any remaining deficits and you set the tax rate accordingly. This is similar in a way, but um, the, the tax rate recommendation in December is only a recommendation. It would include any estimated growth in education spending, and that would need to be covered and all the other changes that come in through the you know, non-property tax revenues and all the other estimates that go into it. It would just say that if, if you have a $66 million deficit sitting on the bottom line for FY21, you would not have to raise the tax rate by eight cents to cover that deficit and build that into the recommendation for FY22. Uh, George. Uh, thank you, um, Madam Speaker. So, I mean, if we really, if we're really committed to the idea that we're not going to use uh, the property tax rates to offset any deficit, um, it seems to me that we could go all the way, completely reassure the school boards and actually set the 2021 tax or 2022 tax rate now. You know, this year we set it up three cents, last year went up two cents, you know, after we talked to Brad a bit, we could actually just set it now. And that would be um, really helpful to the school boards and, you know, completely relieve their anxiety if we told them, well, completely relieve but about the taxing part, you know, we could we we could tell them this is what the tax rate is going to be that you're going to have to work with uh, as you build your budget. But if that if if the tax rate is set now, would, would, wouldn't there be there wouldn't be any incentive for districts to have, try to hold down their spending? Um, I don't think. I mean, if if they knew their tax rate, for example, was going to go, only go up by three cents. We're going to set the yield to the average rate on when only when only went up by three cents. You have the problem of individual districts behaving in their own best interest without worrying about the total picture and what would happen to the deficit. Um, does that make sense? George, you're muted. I guess you're muted, George. George, you're muted still. Sorry, oh. I'm trying to unmute you. I can do it. Yes, thank you. Um, individual districts as they're building their budgets, don't worry about what other people are building their budgets. 
and their own individual tax rate is going to depend on their individual spending. So I don't, I, I disagree that it takes away the incentive for them to be, um, to be cautious. It just says what the statewide rate will be, and then they can know what will happen with, you know, with their amount of spending be, beforehand. They can be absolutely certain mm -hmm. and not just work off a letter, which might be very inaccurate um, come, you know, well, come I, the end of the session. So it's an interesting idea, and I, um, you know, so we, we started this discussion because it's clear that the December first letter, which is really a sort of linchpin in terms of timing on school budgets, um, is going to uh, misrepresent the the world, um, and so that's how that's how we got into this discussion. Um, um, I don't want to foreclose this idea, which is interesting and thought about it before, um, but. Um, I do want to at least get the language that Abby's worked on up for people to look at before we, you know, decide which um, which of several different directions we could go in. Um, let me get to Scott, and then maybe I'll have Abby put that language up. Scott, thank you. Um, I, I mean, the largest the largest determiner of tax rates is what districts spend and we won't even know that until March. So I'm not sure if we want to lock ourselves into a tax rate now, but I, I would think that the best thing that we could do for school districts right now in the, in the December 1st letter is to clearly identify any funds that we can come up with that will help them with the costs that we know they're, they're going to have. Um, if we can identify those funds, whether they're CRF or whatever they are, expansion of sales tax to the software or whatever, anything that we can do to identify those revenues and make sure they are included in the tax letter will, will help the, the districts and it'll give them clarity as they start to develop their budgets and wrestle with the tax rate implications of those budgets. That's my two cents. Um, so, so let's let's look at the proposed language that is a draft at this point. Um, I don't. Is Abby is here? This it? Um, that 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 doesn't include. Um, Representative Ansel, this doesn't include the additional language on the- Oh, it doesn't. Oh, okay. Um, um, I, I, ha I, I have that language, I can find it. I don't think Abby is on. Um, no, I don't see her. Um, um, Mark, you're, you're a co-host, so you can share from your computer. Okay, so let me see if I can find it. I um, okay, hold on. Oh, let's see. Share screen. Letter. There it is. Is that coming up? Something is. Yeah. Okay. So that 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 is part that is part of it. I maybe this is uh, this is going to be difficult. Maybe we should. Take a take. Give me a minute, and I can put this together with the other language from Abby. This is only part of it. I don't have them in one on one sheet. Yep. Um, right. So so let's uh, let's let's do that. And maybe while while you're doing that, we could have Brad talk a little bit about the CRF money because that's sure. a big piece of this, and I think it's really important to um, begin to understand what what it is that school districts have um, been able to use and what the uh, what the uh, demand is and so on which I think Brad has um, information for us so we'll go to Brad okay <clears throat> excuse me um, Brad James AC of education just so everyone knows um, so Sorsha would you pull up that Sheet, thank you. Um, what we have at the moment, and I'll talk about this in a second. So give me, let me give you a quick overview. What we have at the moment is the CRF um, applications coming in for the grants. Uh, so there, we have 
We have, that would be 52 supervisor unions. We have not heard from four of them. I'm waiting to hear back from this as to what they're doing. Um, but the numbers that you're looking at now represent the other 48. Uh, and I've kind of broken it out into two pieces. The overall ask for CRF funds from, from the school districts is 71.6 million, that number down at the bottom. I have it split out into two columns. I have the unbudgeted unexpected. And, and what I mean by that is, I mean, those are the costs that they would not have had had it not been for COVID that, that they did not budget for, they did not expect. They just were definitely COVID related. And those are not, um, would have not have been paid for by, through the Ed Fund. And then I have a second column, repurposed budgeting. It's a hard, that's the best words I could come up with for, for what this is. These are the numbers that were in their budget that because of federal guidance, they said are eligible for replacement of numbers that are in their budget. So th that, that column repurposed budgeting uh, basically means these are, the, this, this is, these are the numbers that will be able to reduce education fund payments for FY21. <clears throat> so there are three lines here. There's the March, June, FY20. So that, that's the first period. And that total is 22 million. Of that 22 million, roughly 16.2 million should be able to be replaced by reduced money from the Ed Fund payment in FY21. Um, that's, that's the money that rolls forward according to Act 120. This number may go up. I can't guarantee it. These are preliminary numbers. I have not been through all the requests yet. Um, one, of the, one of the reasons I say they may go up, I don't think they'll go down, but they may go up um, is because when the, when the application first went out, the collection vehicle did not have information necessarily the way I wanted it to come out. So I didn't, it wasn't, it was broken out. It was a single number as opposed to what the, was unexpected and what was repurposed. And so once I put it out there as repurposed, other people switched in. So, so that 16.2 million may go up. We then asked them what, what had they spent over the summer and then what do they expect to spend through December because that's when the CRF funds December 30th. And in, in, uh, in the July, August period, they spent another third, they're anticipating another 13.3 million of that, about three and a half million can be used to reduce education fund money. So that was in their, including their budgets. And then what they're projecting for FY, for the, for the uh, September, December period is about another 36 million. And of that, about seven and a half million has been identified by the business managers as possibly being, as, as being um, eligible for CRF reimbursement. So the total amount that I think will roughly, the total amount that will be able to reduce the education fund payments in FY20 is about 27.2 million at the moment. Again, I need to go back over these. These are preliminary numbers. I have not been through all of them. We're still missing four SUs, and I'm hoping that some of the districts who did not say that they had repurposed budgeting numbers or figures will have some, and that hopefully that will push that number up. So that's kind of the high-level overview at the moment, if there are questions right now. Scott has a question. Go ahead. Yes. Um, this uh, Brad Mark, this $27,249,000 repurposed budgeting, is that reflected on the most recent, uh, the September 9 Ed Fund Outlook? I'll answer for Mark because he, he's working. The answer is no. Um, and the reason okay. is because that, num that number just came out two days ago. It's, I, I hesitate to really put it out there as an official number at the moment, just simply because I have not been through all these, all these applications yet. I want to go through them first and then put them in. But I think, I think that's a number that you can more or less count on. Um, okay. But I, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, Put hesitations around that a little bit, just because I have. Okay, not so I'm wondering if if I'm correct in thinking that the the deficit in the most recent Ed Fund outlook, which was projected to be I think 66.4 million, so. is really 66.4 million minus 27 to 49. I think I think it will be in that ball. Okay, well that's good news. Well, it is good news. I'm hoping it will become yeah. better. Uh, but yeah, yeah it, it is good okay. news. All right. Um, and this does, this is just CRF. This does not include ESSER. That's, yes, thank you, right. Representative Ansel, Chair Ansel. Yes, this does not include ESSER. This is only CRF, and I forgot to talk about ESSER briefly. ESSER 
what, what I'm hearing from business managers is that they are holding off applying for ESSER and, and deciding what they're going to do with ESSER until they see what's happening with the CRF money. The reason for that is twofold. CRF money expires more quickly than, or much sooner than does the ESSER money. CR, as I said, CRF money expires <coughs> on the 30th. Um, ESSER money goes through September 30th, 2022, I believe maybe September 1, one or the other of those two, but it's, it's, a, it's a ways out. And additionally, the ESSER money is more flexible. It's, it's, it's allowed for more purposes. Um, we've been as, as flexible as we can be based on U.S. Treasury guidance for the CRF money, but the ESSER, ESSER money is more flexible. So a number of districts I know are looking at if they had to hire somebody for to talk to people or for, for whatever purposes because of the COVID-19 response, then what they're trying to do is they're trying to use the CRF money for the first roughly half of the year and then backfill that second half of the year with the ESSER money. So we're not sure what's going to happen with ESSER money yet. Um, it's, I think we've only received three applications at this point out of 52. And those, those three, I don't believe, have been moved forward. Uh, Peter. Uh, yes. <clears throat> yes, thank you, Brad. Uh, I want to get my arms around the uh, subtotal in the left column um, yeah. of uh, 44,353. Uh, I'm oh, sorry, 44 million. How will that play in terms of district budget is? Will they have to eat that or somehow or another find, uh, uh, since it's unbudgeted, it implies that they're going to spend it, but they haven't actually provided for it. Uh, maybe I should or shouldn't include the FY20, but in any case, the bulk of that number is uh, FY21. How, how do I interpret that burden on the districts? Okay, so so the way the way we've been presenting information to the districts is that we're going to look at payment of the the CRF money kind of in a in a in a, in a uh, layered structure. The first thing we're going to do is repay everything that we can for FY20. So that'd be that 22 million on that, that whole top line. Um, so, and and that, that way everybody will be whole for that. Now, what you did in Act 120 is going through everything you, you allocated out, you appropriated $50 million for, for the uh, districts when all was said and done with the, where it was going. There's about 29 million for K-12. So we're using roughly 22 million of that for the K-12 right now. That leaves about $7 million left over. So if I, I'm in the right-hand column at the moment. Um, so if I take that 13.3 and that 36 for FY21, we're at basically um, $49 million. We only have seven at the moment. I understand that you're appropriating more. Or there's in, in the new budget bill, there's more pro, higher appropriation, but right now there's only $7 million. So what we will have to do is we will have to prorate out that. I'm going to subtract the six million for the 44. I'm pointing with my pen. You can't see that. I'm going to subtract the six million in the left-hand column from the 44 million, and leave, which leaves about 38 million. And then there's and the, and the same. So we're getting up to the 20 to the 49 million. When when we're well, let's see, a seven seven million is roughly a seventh of 49 million. So each district will get about 14 percent of what they're asking for for FY21 at the moment. Um, that's that would be that be the proration factor. Well, did, did that's that assuming sense? that's assuming no other money gets appropriated. That that's correct. That's correct. But that's, we're appropriating that's, more money. That's right. I mean, and, why are we? That, doesn't seem like a, um, I mean, it's a, I, I understand the math, but it isn't where we're going to end up. No, that's, that's true. It's just that I don't know what the final number is going to be. And I was going to come right back sure. to that. Um, but I, and I, and Mark, correct me if I'm wrong, is it another 32 million that is being appropriated? For um, yeah. the, okay. the, the, the house is, the, the, yeah, the house is um, poised to uh, appropriate an additional $32 million. Okay. Um, most of which would be available to LEAs to reimburse them. Okay. So, so then, then if we were to take that seven million that's kind of left over from from that top line of twenty two million, that leaves about thirty nine million versus a forty nine million dollar ask. So we, right. what we would do, Representative Conlon, is, is, is we, or Anthony, is we would we would prorate. Um, the, the money. So, so that would mean that there would be a deficit, roughly, roughly twenty-five percent, maybe, um, of, of uh, 
what what they're what they're requesting 20 to 25 percent that would be a deficit that would roll forward into another year uh, scott and then kathleen brad that first column there unex unbudgeted unexpected is that a is that a gross or a net number that the districts are reporting what i mean by that is, is i mean there, there are savings in here too. Uh, reduce energy costs, reduce contract services. I mean, a lot of expenses that I'm sure districts were able to shed, especially in March through June of FY20. Is this a, is this 44 million? Is this, is this just the expenses they've had to take on, or does it include the uh, any of savings they may have found? I don't know for certain. I. From what I'm hearing, my guess is that this is largely the gross number, not a net number. Okay. From what I had heard from, and I'm talking to business managers tomorrow, from what I'd heard from business managers in previous conversation with them is a lot of the monies that they were able to save in FY20, they're going to offset yeah. some of them. Some of them were using it to offset it. It varies from SU to SU, quite, SU to SU quite a bit. Some of them did use those savings to offset these costs, so they didn't ask for CRF money. Um, Others, others are taking those savings and rolling them forward for FY20, use in FY22, the way current law is structured. Um, that's, that's when that, those savings would be available for them to use. But I think to answer your question more directly, I think these are mostly gross numbers. I don't think they're net numbers in general. I'm sure there's some netting in there, okay. but I think it's mostly gross. Okay, thank you. Kathleen. Brad, will the ESSER money um, also reduce pressure on the Ed Fund and help to um, reduce the amount of the anticipated deficit? It has the potential to. Um, the, the way it's very clear in the CARES Act when they're talking about ESSER that, that we as a state have no say in how the, the school districts, the supervisory units choose to use that money. They are all aware of the issue. I've been talking to them about it for months and months and months at this point. They understand the issue with the FY21 Ed Fund. They understand the issue that it will roll, for, if it's not fixed in FY21, it will roll forward to FY22, making that difficult. Um, but we can't tell them how to use it. We can suggest to them how to use it. And we have, we have suggested that if possible and as to the greatest extent possible, you need to cover your unexpected needs, but also if, if you can cover some of your budgeted purposes too to help the Ed Fund. They're all aware of that. Um, whether they're all going to do it or not, I, I can't say definitively, but my guess is that 95% of them will, and a few may not. But, but, but to, I don't, I can't give you any estimate at the moment about how much of it of the ESSER money would be available to reduce the Ed Fund deficit. Um, again, it, it depends on how they choose to use it. Thanks. Uh, Emily? Did you say my name and I didn't hear you the first time? I, I um, did, but okay. it's not. It's my internet. Quite a day with such things. Um, to follow up on Representative James's question, do you have a system for accounting for how they are spending the ESSER money as we go along? Are they gonna re be reporting that to you so we can understand it better? Um, and then to follow up on, I think Representative Beck's question around net and gross, do we have a sense of um, if communities are gonna be sort of spending in excess of caps because of unanticipated COVID costs and what are the implications of that? So let me do the latter one first. When you say caps, you're talking about excess spending threshold. Is that what mm -hmm. you mean? That is what I mean. Thank you. Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> Just to making sure. Um, I appreciate you clarifying. At, at, at the moment, no, I don't have I don't have any sense of that. Um, it will depend on on how much money is available for CRF to offset these costs. If um, Is, is done and in the books basically for, for the vast majority of districts at this point. I think only two have not yet passed a budget and four or five still are in the 30 day reconsideration period. Um, so for all intents and purposes, FY21 is done. Um, I, think, I think the question that you're asking is really pertaining to FY22 and I don't have any feel for that at the moment. I think a lot of that is going to depend on how this, this what we're looking at right here all plays out and what they're able to do with those, those bodies. My guess is if there's not enough CRF money to 
fully fund, again, the number I have here at the moment, that's $71.6 million, then my guess is that that will probably push some people over. Um, that could easily be changed and, and fixed by, by session laws, just saying that any COVID-related re expenses are excluded from the excess spending threshold. Um, and then going back to the, now, I've, now I talked too much and I forgot the first question. It had to do with Representative James's question about. Um, do you have a system for understanding uh, and tracking ESSER spending, you. even if you yes. don't get to control it? Yes, yes, thank you. Um, yes, when, in the applications, there's, there's much more detail behind these numbers that you're seeing here. Um, it's broken out into, generally speaking, from what I've seen from most applications, 15 to 20 broad categories. Um, range from transportation, salaries and benefits, personal protective equipment, et cetera, et cetera. You know, HVAC if it's not covered by the, the efficiency Vermont money. Um, it's it, so so it is broken out. And then when when we're when we're looking at these later on, we will when they are requesting money, we will be asking for them to send in information from their accounting system that details it out in more detail. So we're looking at it broadly, you know, far, far, far less broadly than what you're seeing here on the screen. Um, we're, look, we're looking at it in some detail just to make sure that their general expenses are, 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 um, are uh, eligible. And then once they start requesting the money, then they will be sending us more specific information that we will have. And we, so we can provide that to you too. Right, right now, I haven't put it out there simply because I have not reviewed it. Um, and I, I want to go over before I start putting numbers out there that people have sent in to us. Thanks. Um, I'm, I've been, I think we've all been struggling lately with getting um, information in enough real time to be making good decisions about it. Um, right. And I, right. I just, I'm nervous about having too much of a lag time with district spending and the information getting to you and then it getting to us and how that all works. But um, I don't think that's something we have to figure out today. Thanks. Well, well I, I, I understand exactly what you're saying. Um, and, and, I have a group of people who have gone through the applications. Um, they, they've been they've been very good. They've worked through, and that's where these numbers are largely coming from. There are things that I need to review too, um, and I, I'm hoping to be done have have a have a overall review done by the end of the day Friday, um, at the latest. Which means that's what the rest of today and tomorrow will be for me. I won't be doing much of anything else. Um, now, now I'm saying my internet connection is unstable. If, if somebody can still, Mark, I can see you, or, or Scott, I can see you. Would you raise your hand if you can still hear me? It just said my internet sounds, okay, good. All right. Um, so so I, I, think, I think we'll have a pretty good sense of what's going on by the end of the day, Friday, and I can send that information out to you all. So I, I don't wanna lose sight of um, sort of what it is that um, we, can do as a legislature now um, and sort of what, what should we do, um, which is really the focus of this meeting. Um, uh, Sarita has a question and then I think I'll switch, go back to Mark and... Um... Thank you, um, Chair Ansel. I, I'm just wondering, and this may be, we don't need to answer this right away, but I'm wondering what assumptions are being used uh, with these numbers in terms of COVID, uh, you know, in terms of what's the worst case scenario and what's the best case scenario with the, with the way COVID is going to go, if we find a vaccine, if we don't find a vaccine that doesn't work, if there's a second wave of COVID, do we have additional savings or is that, will we keep the savings in the reserves? I'm just, I think we're, it sounds like we're just assuming that, um, you know, COVID, there'll be a direction and we're basing um, some decisions on the, and I'm just wondering, do we, you know, is that an assumption and are there other scenarios that we're also, you know, kind of planning for? If I, if I may, um, the CRF money, if it is not spent by the end of December 30th, it goes back to US Treasury. So it, 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 cannot, it cannot be held in reserve. The, the US Treasury guidance also says you cannot use the CRF money to 
get supplies that you may need in advance. It's it's for the current situation what is what they're saying. So if there's a second wave, unless um, if it happens, that second wave happens after December 30th, and you know it's going to happen, the U.S. Treasury guidance says you can't purchase it could be equipped for that. What most of what people are getting though at this point can be used in the future, which is which is fine. He current is currently and in the future. Okay. Thank you. Um Mark, are you are you ready to look at a a draft? <laughs> I, I think so. Well, let's just try I put together let's okay. see here. Um, this it yes okay so um i'm gonna start off by telling you I'm, I'm not a drafter and so i put this together um abby's not available this morning apparently so um uh, no i thought she got i thought i saw that she jumped on she That's jumped on she has yes yeah. yeah, she's she's here so um do you want to have abby walk through this or i, oh. I um if she wants to and she's ready, that'd be, that's fine. And otherwise, you can you should do it. Um, okay. I'm, I'm, sorry. I'm here. Um, yeah. Abby, Abby, just so you know, what, what's on the screen um, was I, I just added the language that we were suggesting in terms of intent, those first two paragraphs, right. yep, and attached I, it to what you had sent me previously. Not in proper right. form. Okay. Yes. And I actually was reworking that this morning just to put it into more standard formatting um, and to add in some sort of intent findings lead in. Um, so the, the first two sections here would set out the intent to um, allow to, in the way that section two of what was passed in June of Act 122, that set out the intent of the General Assembly to address any projected or created deficit for fiscal year 21 by using federal funds, reversions, drawing down the stabilization reserve and other sources of revenue. And then setting out existing law, which currently requires the commissioner of taxes when um, the commissioner releases the December 1st letter to calculate um, and recommend the yields and the uh, non-homestead rate because current law would require any projected deficit to be folded into those rates as well as the stabilization reserve being maintained at 5%. Um, the uh, recommendations would have, because that would have to take into account any projected deficit, the language that's proposed below um, would not withstand these requirements and require the, the commissioner to make um, the yield and non-homestead rates not include the deficit and not include a 5% stabilization reserve. So this uh, let's see, sorry, as you scroll down, there we go. The, on page two, you'll see the two, the two pieces that are not withstood. So no projected deficit in the education fund for fiscal year 21 in setting the 22 property tax rates and yields and assuming that the stabilization reserve is what the reserve is maintained at the point in time when the December 1st letter is coming out. So we, I pinged this to the statute um, it's also within the December 1st letter section that talks about the education fund outlook being released by JFO. It's at on or before December 1st. So there is um, that sort of cutoff. We would know at that point what the stabilization reserve is. And I believe Mark has numbers for what the current amount is, but um, this would say that the commissioner takes whatever the 21 amount is before December 1st and ignores the projected deficit. So I am working on that language and I will be able to get that to you a little more polished this morning. Scott. Yeah, so Abby, the way I understand that is that the, the commissioner will not be required to refill the reserve when calculating the yields. Um, so it would, it would only be up to the amount that it currently is set. Okay, so I guess that's my uh, question. December. What is it currently? <laughs> um, can, can, I, can, I, can I jump in here? Because this, this is where yeah. I, got, I got you confused um, when I first introduced this. And um, let me see if I can pop up the education fund outlook for you. Um, okay. Stop share and let's see. Screen. Okay. So um, the way that 
we present um, the deficit and the stabilization reserve in the education fund does not conform to general accounting principles. If we were doing it with general accounting principles, you would say the deficit is $66.4 million less the $38.2 million we have in the reserve. Right. So I was concerned that the administration would interpret that language and um, to say that the, the gap deficit, which is 66 minus 38, is the deficit that you don't want to offset. We would then go into FY22 with an empty stabilization reserve. And the law then, again, the statute requires that the stabilization reserve be re restored to 5%. I'm sorry, I know this is a little bit weedy, but um, that, that's yeah. the reason for that additional language in there. It's not intended to do anything with the stabilization reserve. It's, it's, to, it's intended to make sure that whether the administration interprets the deficit to be $66 million or 66 minus $38 million, they cannot replace that money with property tax money. So, Scott, are you done? I, I think so. so I guess what I'm so I'm asking is is that when when the December first letter is constructed and there's an associated ed fund outlook with it, will we be looking at a, a line twenty six or will we be looking at thirty eight point two or will we be looking at some other number? Um, it, it depends how the administration wants to wants to play this in terms of how they interpret what the deficit is, but the intention was to not allow them to use the property tax to offset any of this step any of the deficit regardless of how they interpret it i maybe okay. i can lay, lay, okay we can lay it out on a sheet but they could come in and say the deficit's really only 28 million so we won't use the property tax to offset that 28 but we will use the property tax money to then, then restore the reserve back to five percent which is the same thing okay so, you know what I mean? The, 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 yeah. This distinction between a, a surplus and a deficit, it's, it doesn't really hold up when you, in terms of accounting principles. So that, Okay, that's I, think I'm, I'm, I think I'm starting to get my head around the idea. So thank you. Can I, I want to go back to what we're trying to do here. That what, what I hope we're doing is we're telling school boards and ultimately ta taxpayers that they're not responsible for the, def for the projected deficit in fiscal 21. Yes, I think that's what we're trying to do. That's right. Um, and I don't, want to, I don't want to get so lost in the in the um, the uh, account, accounting principles and all this kind of stuff to lose sight of what we're what we're trying to tell them. Um, right. That right. they still need to do their budgets the way that, you know the the budget that they um, need to create for fiscal twenty two. Uh, needs to take into account the needs of the kids, the um, which are related to base needs and then pandemic related needs. Um, and they should not be building into their budgets um, money to address the fiscal 21 deficit. Yes, and I, I think that's what this language does. And that, the rest that's, of, what, that's what we want to get. Right. The rest of this is inside baseball, but I felt like we had to address it's important, it. Because it's, but I don't want to lose, I don't want to lose that of the message. Here. Right. And um, normal, normally, I probably wouldn't have even brought this up. But in the draft, we've had to include that section that addresses the stabilization reserve. And it's very confusing unless you've un understood this background piece. So I think what you've said is exactly what yeah. this language does. Okay. Um, and I guess I'd look around to the committee. Uh, is the committee on board with doing something now to accomplish uh, to, to not just send a message, but make sure that the um, the statute which governs that uh, December first letter reflects uh, that position. That we uh, we're we're not asking school boards um, to develop budgets that will account for this um, fiscal twenty one deficit projected deficit. Uh, I'm on George board. and Kath yeah. Kathleen. Yeah, I would say as a minimum, I am absolutely on board with with that. Yeah, I, you know, could even go further, but um, but I, as a minimum, I think that that would be really important. Definitely. Yeah. Um, thanks, Chair Ansel. I'm I'm curious to know where or whether the um, issue of ADM fits in here because I know that's been a particular concern to um, my SU. So um, 
it, it's not in here. Um, and uh, oh, sort of the second part of what it is that we were hoping to talk about this morning. Um, so we'll, we'll, that's an important question. Uh, Jim, Aslan. Well, me, I'm certainly on board with this concept. Let's see what we can do. Kate, are you trying to jump in? Emily, good. Oh, uh, uh, Mark, can you take down the screen share so that we can see everybody? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Emily. Almost eye contact now. Um, <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm on board with this idea. I would also like to figure out a way to go a little bit further so districts know that they um, can really have the flexibility to meet the very changing and difficult needs of um, kids and families right now, which I'm not sure they always feel like they can do during a regular budget year. Hey, I don't know that you can actually raise your hand. Do you want to jump in? Sure. Thank you. Uh, I also very much appreciate you. Um, uh, Representative Ansel in helping us get out of some of the detail of, of accounting and back into the reason that we're here, which is needing to respond to the school districts and, and, and administrators who are very concerned about how they're going to address their budget budgets. And this is clearly one issue that they will help to alleviate uh, some of those concerns. And as we move forward, we can look at we can look at some of the others in the next part of our conversation. So I appreciate this and thank you. Bill. Yeah, Jenna, as a point of clarification, this being session law, this is only temporary, right? Next year we go back to business as usual okay. in regards to the left. Yes, from the we hope. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Kate, do you want to? Take a, a, so so I think I think we have sort of tentative agreement. Um, we may tweak language, but is that can I get sort of I don't know. I mean, people nod their heads or something. <laughs> um, so we're we're working on this. There may be some language tweaks, um, but this seems like this is an important thing to do and um, make sure that the um, people who are going to have to work with this on the ground, understand what our intention is. Um, so uh, Kate, do you want to lead the conversation around the uh, letter? Sure, thank you. Um, I think uh, a lot of our interest came when we were approached by the uh, various associations about the challenge in building budgets. Not only were they dealing with the challenges of trying to uh, start this school year, we're also looking at the challenges they're going to have in in writing their budgets. And one of the issues that came forward of, of great concern was what was happening with homeschoolers and the fact that we knew that they had uh, doubled in number this year, the applications had doubled. Yet we, um, as we worked through it, we realized that we could not tell at this point in time whether this was a broad uh, concern or whether this was one that was gonna be more of an isolated concern for small districts where the impact would be large. Um, so we had looked at three possible solutions. I'm hoping today we can come up with a fourth. Uh, we also heard um, some concern from the, um, the, the special ed uh, association that there is great concern about the way that the agency is viewing compensatory education as it relates to COVID related learning loss and the impact on budgets that that could have. And we also, of course, have the concern related to um, two failed budgets. And um, people are a lot of people are asking us to do things at a time where the data that we have is just not sufficient to make a good uh, cross the, the the board decision. So we were looking at what data do we need? What do we need to be able to make an informed decision? And um, so, as a result, we have. Um, worked with uh, JFO to come up with uh, a letter to address those issues, to ask the agency to be prepared to respond to us. Rather than on day one, we're asking them for this. We want them to be gathering that information now because they can. 
you know, for example, you know, also in terms of the homeschoolers, we don't know how that's going to affect the October account. We also don't know if by December that's going to look more normal or January. So um, I think uh, I think Mark, do you have a letter that you can bring forward? Yes. Um, and I just also I want to say that there's. Mark. Whoops. Was, oh, you got it, Sorsha? I do. Thank you. Okay. Is this the correct one? Um, yes. Okay, great. And, and before you start, Mark, I just wanted to say that the, the more that we talked in, in smaller conversations, the more concerned we ca became with doing anything in statute related to ADM. Mm -hmm. um, so I just wanted to say why we were looking at this alternative approach to addressing the, the problem to, to help the school districts know that we hear them and we're going to act. So do, do you want me to walk you through the letter a little yes, bit? Yes, please or, do. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so um, this is a letter to, this, to the Secretary of Education that points out that the legislature is going to be adjourning um, at the end of this month and you won't be back in January. But there's some additional information that you would be very interested in receiving um, in, in having the AOE work on in the interim so that when you do come back in January, you'd be poised to take action if you, if you need to or you, if you deem it necessary. Um, the, one of the reasons for the delay is it's going to take the Agency of Education some time to compile this information and get it together, especially information around the census and ADM is not going to be collected until October. So um, this would give the agency the opportunity to collect this information for you and it would provide it to you on January 15th um, if they return the information by then, which is the point at which you can actually do something um, once you've come back. So we identified four areas um, that, we, that the legislature would like to see more information about. The first is um, use of federal funds. And this is the um, what topic that Brad's been covering this morning. But um, we, this letter would request a full accounting of not only the CRF monies and how that money has been used, um, the, the appropriated CRF money for K through 12, as well as the ESSER money and the GEAR money, the governor's money that he's planning to distribute to tech centers. And in order to assess the impact um, of this federal aid on the projected FY21 deficit, um, we're also requesting um, to know how much of that aid will be used to reimburse districts for previously budgeted costs. Those are the costs that can help chip away at the deficit. Brad's pointed out this morning that you have about 20, he thinks about $27 million is available now. This, this is asking for a, a more thorough accounting of that once all the information is in and the agency's had a chance to go through all the requests. Um, everybody okay on that part before I move on? Yes. Can you page down a little bit, Sorsha, to ADM? So um, average daily membership, um, that information is collected in an October census. Um, so. Um, right now, we don't have a really good idea of how that's going to play out, and we also don't know, we know how many homeschoolers are opting um, out at this point, but we don't know where they're located, if it's clustered um, in different parts of the state, or if it's going to uh, have a, a, you know, a more significant impact on small districts than larger districts. So this section of the letter basically asks for an analysis of the change in ADM between October 19 and October 2020. But it also asks them for a report on the number of students who have opted for homeschooling in, um, in, the, in, the, in this current year, but who were enrolled in their homeschool district in the previous year. And it also asks for information on the number of homeschoolers who returned to their homeschool district after the October 2020 census. We're thinking that it would be possible for AOE to collect this information along with the information they collect on ADM during the October census. So that's, any questions on that part of it? No. Is this document available somewhere that I? <laughs> just, just on my machine, my, my computer so far. I can, Go training um, through your computer into my computer. Okay, thank you. <laughs> and I, and again, this, this is just that, you know, this was a first draft. This is just the first cut at this letter. Um, we were trying to, you know, based on what the, the committee had been describing as um, need for more information. This is what we came up with. Um, the third part of here is the special education service plans. Um, in October, school districts report their, um, their service plan requests to the Agency of Education. 
So this asks for some, some of that information, which I think is normally available anyways. But it also asks for an estimated cost of any compensatory services that are provided for special needs students. And the concern there is if districts have to go remote or if they're hybrid, um, is there going to be a pressure on special ed in order to provide um, the services that um, special needs kids have? Um, for example, they, they may not be able to be fully served remotely in some cases. So it's asking for information on that. And then last, um, there's a request for um, an update on the operational status of all school districts. Um, we know now that there's a mix of um, full-time, part-time and hybrid and homeschooling. So um, this would give an update to find out how many districts have been able to stay open or close in, in, the, in the interim. And it would also ask for the status of any school districts that failed to pass their budgets for, the, for this, this year. Right now, there's only two of those. Um, but um, you would get some back, back some information on how that, that issue was resolved. So anyways. Now this, is a, this is a living document here right now. There's, there's yes, opportunity yes. For, for folks to participate in this. I just would also, I note that you've used the term compensatory services, and that's actually, um, just want to make sure that we, because that's actually a, a, a federal, um, uh, federally uh, available to parents and they can sue to get them versus, okay. um, versus uh, COVID-related um, learning loss. And we can talk about that later, but Okay. But there are some distinctions in terms of the way that the education has just put out guidance that has some of the school districts um, worried uh, that it actually could provide um, some legal access that they hadn't planned on. Okay. Um, shall I take over? Shall I do take over here? Okay, Janet. Okay, um, Peter Conlon. Uh, thank you. Uh Maybe if Brad's still on, uh, I, I need just a quick reminder of ADM. I know it is a rolling two-year average, but does it also lag behind a year? So that if, if we did see a precipitous drop in AD, AD, students, ADM is, ADM is, is a 20-day a, a full-time equivalency count of students in a district of residence that are publicly funded. Um, that that's what ADM is. When it is rolled into equalized pupils, which affects right. tax rates, then it is a two-year average, and it does lag behind a year because the equalized pupils are calculated based on this year. The equalized pupils, pardon me, for next year FY22 are based on this year FY21 and FY20 last year. All right. So if we saw for FY21 or school year 21 or 2021. Uh, precipitous drop in students due to um, homeschooling, the impact of that wouldn't actually hit until budgeting for FY23? No. It, it, FY22. It, it would hit for FY22 because it what would happen, it would hit in FY22 and FY23 because it's okay. a two year average. Yeah. What would happen is you would get half that decrease in FY22 and the second half of that decrease in FY21 because the decrease was in FY20, or part, not 21, my apologies, FY23, because the decrease was in FY21. So it, it works for two years of equalized pupils. All right. And Brad, okay. at one at one point, we had had asked if we could get uh, some sense of the homeschool applications based on um, school districts, and we learned that that was basically going to uh, sink the system at the time. Uh, uh, moving forward, uh, with knowing that this is coming in advance, is that something that that can be done? Do, do school districts specifically know that uh, there are students in their district that are being homeschooled? I'm not sure. I, I will have to check into that. I don't know the answer. I don't think school districts know definitively that, that people are being homeschooled. They may have been told, but I don't know that for a fact. I believe in our system, though, we once the homeschool applications are run through, it does tell us what town they live in so we can fit in the grades. So we can certainly figure out what district, if nothing else. If and they, you if don't they, tell that you don't tell that district this this member of your community. I, I not not to my knowledge. I, I don't know. I don't deal with homeschool too much, but I can I can check okay. on that and see. I mean, ho home homeschoolers do also participate um, in in their school districts' activities. I I think that um, they can have a certain percentage of their um, 
classes at the district and participate in extracurricular activities and those kind of things? Right. They, they, they can, they can, they can take classes. And if they take classes, they get prorated for ADM. If they take, if they partake in an after school activity such as sports, which I don't think is going to be happening too much, um, they get a, they get a very small percentage of ADM too. So, so if, if they do, if they are involved with the school, either through extracurricular or through a class or two, then they are counted as, as a partial ADM. I think 60% needed to be homeschooled. If, if I remember from, I, I think, I think that's, I think that's correct. Catherine James. Thanks, Chair Webb. Um, I want to make sure I'm, I'm thinking through the timing correctly here. Um, so if a, uh, a school or, you know, an SU or a district will learn in October, um, that's when the census is taken. Um, and perhaps they've experienced a, a precipitous or a meaningful drop in enrollment because of homeschooling or Maybe students have temporarily chosen to go to an independent school that's open and offering in-person instruction. And maybe a lot of those students are gonna come back in January. Let's just, I'm just tossing out a hypothetical. Um, and if, if none of this information is due to the legislature until January, and we've just come back into session, budgets are done by then. And this, you know, decisions have been made and um, you know, if, if boards have made spending or, or you know, spending decisions based on enrollment declines they've seen that may be corrected or temporary or fluctuating um, for that year, um, and we come back into session in January and we start taking testimony and talking about a bill and then it goes over to the Senate and things start moving along and town meeting happens. And I, I just, I'm, I'm concerned about the timing of the process here. Um, I mean, what was can the I, data? Can I, can I jump in on that? Just, you know, to point, I just want to point out that um, school boards do not know what their tax rate is going to be. Um, you know, the, the January letter is just an estimate or a recommendation at the time that they base their budgets on but there's no assurances that they're gonna have a particular tax rate until the legislature actually passes yields in, in June of the year. So there's, there's always a certain amount of flux in, the, in what the tax rate's gonna be for a town, depending on what their, you know, what their per pupil spending has been. Um, so I, the, the question I think here is that, or what we're trying to get at is that um, we don't know right now how big the impact is going to be. It may be that the impact of homeschooling is spread out all across the state, in which case it will not have a very significant impact on anyone since we raise the same amount of money and send out the same amount of money from the school district. I think the concern was that there may be some small districts that have a, a you know, because of their unique situation, have a particularly difficult situation with this. And the idea would be that if you had this information at hand when you return in, in uh, January, you could act as expeditiously to address that at that time. Um, right now, we would be shooting in the dark a little bit because we know how many homeschoolers um, are out there, but we, we don't know where they're located. Other questions? Again, this is this would be a letter that um, it, when the legislature ends, it doesn't mean that the letter can't continue. That we can't can't continue. Um, and I know that I, our committee will meet tomorrow and I'm happy to bring this forward and see if there are other things that you would want uh, to ask the agency. I, I, I know our committee needs to be out of here at 1025 because we have another, another meeting at 1030, but um, I think we could probably hear from, uh, I don't know if the school boards are in the room. Uh, Chair Webb, I apologize. I just lowered George Representative Till's hand. And I think he had a question. <laughs> well, I re recognize George Till. <laughs> I wondered who lowered it. <laughs> um, he said at the beginning of this that when, when we looked at, we looked at it more, we became more concerned about putting anything in statute about altering ADMs. Um, and I had a couple questions. You didn't explain that at all, what these concerns were or who the we was. I would say 
I'll, I'll let Janet uh, address that as well, but I would say that uh, leadership. Janet, do you, you're a little bit more. Uh, well, um, I think, I, I guess I have two thoughts about that. Um, one is the one is more on the positive side. One of the benefits of a letter, in my view, is that we don't need to uh, figure out exactly what it is that we're asking for uh, today or close the door. Um, we can supplement the letter with additional questions as additional issues arise. And um, my sense is that that's um, going to happen. Um, the other is putting a bill with ADM on the floor is going to attract amendments on other issues and uh, some of them are quite frankly not ready to deal with. Other questions? Um, I don't know if the school boards are in the room or not. Um, can, can, can I? Um, yes. I, I do want to hear from the school boards but again I want to go back to what we what we are intending to do here and not get too lost in the in the words, um, what we what we want to do here is we want to um, uh, make a, a clear uh, commitment and a clear path to getting the information that we feel we need in order to be able to make quick decisions uh, to respond to issues around uh, the federal money. There, uh, there, there are just so there's so much uncertainty. I, some, I think it may have been Sarita was asking the question about, you know, we don't know what the virus is going to do, and we don't. There's so much uncertainty, and the way our education system works of necessity is that things uh, get locked in. Um, and what we want to do is we want to build in as much uh, uh, information information and flexibility so that we can respond um, and respond quickly. And so that's the purpose of this. And um, if there are things that the uh, school boards and um, other folks feel that we need to add to make this letter more meaningful, um, I think Kate and I are both very open to doing and Brad, just to go back to you, um, I, I, and, and I can't remember what the date was on, on this for them to get back to us, Mark, but what would, what would be the earliest that you think that you could provide the information that we're asking so far? Can you get to that? Could you do it in November? I, I, think, I think we could have, a, a, I'm thinking in terms of ADM at the moment. Um, yeah. yeah, I'm not on my mute. Um, I think probably by mid-November we would have a pretty good number. Um, yeah, I think that's when when data are due to us. Uh, it might be a week or so after that, so we can compile it and put it together. But I think by the beginning of December we would certainly have a number. Um, by by current law, it, it's to be frozen on December fifteenth. So there, we're kind of in that window where, where the numbers are out there by by early December at the latest, and then people are looking at them and making sure they're correct and revise them if necessary. But that's if we give a, a good idea. So I'd, I'd certainly say by December. And I would think that we could probably, I, I, again, I don't know about homeschool, but my guess is we probably have a pretty good idea about homeschool by then too, but I don't know that for a fact. Thank you. Sue, is there, are there things that you would add to this letter? Good morning. Thank you for uh, allowing us to comment. Sue Siglowski from the Vermont School Boards Association. Um, this is the first uh, we've seen of this letter this morning. So I would um, like the opportunity to um, give this a little bit more thought and provide you with some, um, some written feedback. Um, also just would like to um, let the committees know that we continue to be very concerned about um, possible declines in ADM due to homeschooling and other issues, um, a variety of, um, of reasons. So due to the pandemic, so that um, does continue to be a concern for the School Boards Association. Thank you. Um, we can take this up tomorrow morning when we need. And I don't see anything else at this point. So, um, so I think this is um, 
set up as our meeting and uh, we invited because Sorsha is running it. So we have an agenda at 10, at 10, 15 or so. We don't have witnesses, so we can, you know, we're flexible in terms of time. But I think if, if when, when we're done with the joint meeting, um, we would just say goodbye to all of you. Um, we'll head upstairs. We're heading up to human services. Okay. So. okay. Um, okay. Um, thank you very much. We will, um, at 1030, our house education will be heading to the uh, Zoom room with uh, human services. So I will see you there. And thank you very much, um, Janet, for this combined effort to deal with this difficult issue in a very complex time. It is, it is a tough one. We appreciate your being, being with us. Uh, so, uh, ways main stay on this call, please. I keep wanting to hit leave, and I'm not.